The Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Now, before we get started, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Kelly Barnhill is the director of the Nutrition Clinic at the Johnson Center. She is a certified clinical nutritionist with over a decade of experience working with nutrition in children with autism and related disorders. At the Johnson Center, she directs a team of dietitians and nutritionists that has served more than 3,000 children. In addition to her clinical practice, Kelly also serves as the clinical care director overseeing management and implementation of disciplinary care across the practices within the organization. These webinars are made possible through generous donor support, including the grant from Local 25 Boston Teamsters. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website at autism.com. And now Kelly, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Denise. Um, thanks for joining us today. I want to talk this afternoon about um, bone mineral density in boys with autism. Uh, so we chose um, to begin this work for a number of reasons, and I want to bullet point those for you in a bit. I want to give you a little bit of information on what's happened in the past decade or so with publication on bone mineral density and why it became important to us to look at from a research perspective. I want to bullet point and give you really clear information on a summary of our findings and what we learned. And I also want to tell you uh, what's still out there that we need to know more about. And I want to give you ideas about our conclusions and what we can say fairly concretely and what we can't. Um, and if there's time at the end of this talk, I'd like to cover some uh, questions as well. So. Why did we feel like it was worth exploring bone mineral density in children with autism? For the past two decades at the Johnson Center and longer than that at ARI, our focus and attention has been on the role of health and nutrition in the overall pediatric population as well as children with autism specifically. Maybe 10 years ago, in late 2008, research work was published indicating that boys with autism had lower bone cortical thickness than their typically developing age match peers. And that research came out and we were a little flummoxed um, because some of the conclusions, including one of them specifically, was that the study uh, indicated that those children um, who were on a casein and gluten-free diet had lower bone cortical thickness and therefore Diets should be discouraged, so diets that eliminated foods should be discouraged for children with autism because it created lower bone density, uh, primarily because that decreases calcium intake and vitamin D intake if you remove casein products from the diet. But we were a little bit puzzled here and wanted to explore it further because that had not been our experience clinically in what we were seeing, though we weren't getting bone mineral density on uh, children that we saw, but we were puzzled because we saw children who had, on elimination diets, healthier dietary intake than their typical peers. Um, so as clinicians and researchers in this area, we wanted to investigate it further. So we looked for funding, um, which was a process in itself, and then we went um, and identified our study design and um, part of what we wanted to do meticulously for us as clinicians specifically was to document nutritional intake to the best of our abilities. And that was a little bit different than studies that had been done in the past, not so much, but um, we wanted to really have every bit of dietary and nutrient data that could possibly impact bone mineral density in our opinion at the time when we developed um, the study protocol. So our theory and hypothesis was that perhaps there were other things in affecting BMD in children with autism in addition to or 
um, in lieu of the idea that low dietary intake of calcium and vitamin D due to a casein-free diet was causing this concern. So this is the story that I referenced, the study that I referenced, um, and the publication essentially indicated that they looked at um, 75 kids with and without autism who were four to eight years old. And uh, the data is there for you, but ultimately that data was interpreted to mean that bone development of autistic boys should be monitored as part of routine care, especially if they're on casein-free diets. And when it was published, which is a read that in itself, in our opinions, clinically, is absolutely a reasonable suggestion because as clinicians, we believe that diets can be safe when they are professionally monitored and supported. Um, but the way that the media and publications interpreted this study was to suggest that no child with autism should follow a gluten and casein-free diet, which was the uncomfortable part for us because we had seen kids respond well to appropriate dietary intervention. Four years later, this Neumeier study came out um, looking at similar issues in slightly older kids. It was a much smaller study, but it essentially validated the work that had been done four years prior in that bone neural density was lower. Um, they also uh, verified that their subjects had lower vitamin D intake from food and their vitamin D uh, serum levels, so their blood levels of vitamin D um, were lower in ASD as well as, and another finding that they reported was decreased exercise and activity um, for their subjects. So these two studies led us to think, okay, what else and how else can we look at this concern? Because it is terribly, it is a concern, and we just wanna make sure that um, we were evaluating it and, and gathering as much data as possible to be able to contribute to this field. So what was our research hypothesis when we began? Well, we really wanted to conduct a case-controlled research study of bone mineral density in children with autism and their peers. We wanted to see if that was correlated with anthrop anthropometric measurements, if it was correlated with bone mineral density, and if it was correlated with nutritional status. And we hoped and believed that we would find other factors through a number of different um, I guess, tools that we were using to evaluate the children that we worked with to examine whether it was correlated with symptomatic uh, GI presentation, for example. So we knew clinically that kids we worked with had fairly significant GI issues that were different and set them apart from their typically developing peers. And because of that, we thought, how do we capture that and what do we what additional information, when we look at this from a comprehensive perspective, do we need to do this and contribute meaningfully to the literature on this topic? So this was our study design. We chose to enroll 40 boys with ASD and 40 boys uh, who were age match controls. Um, inclusion criteria for the kids were first and foremost that they had a parent who could help make this happen. Um, and then that they had no history of a number of genetic disorders that would impact bone formation, metabolism, or their endocrine systems. And there, there is an extensive list in the uh, exclusion criteria that we went through, but we wanted to be comprehensive in making sure that we were evaluating children who didn't have any overt contraindications or concerns that might indicate that they were had an issue with bone formation. We also wanted to um, exclude for children who had been using medication known to affect bone mineral density or had a history of chelation therapy because we know both of those could potentially impact bone mineral density of participants as well. And once those subjects were identified, they underwent confirmation of their diagnosis with a comprehensive AD, ADOS and ADIR evaluation with a psychologist. So in the end, we enrolled a total of 84 boys. They were primarily non-Hispanic, so 75% of the children that we enrolled were non-Hispanic. Um, 
we had three children of those 84 who were unable to be included ultimately in the study because there were missing study components. They were, one child wasn't able to complete the DEXA scan. There was one child we couldn't get blood work on. Um, and a fourth child was removed from the group because the results of his diagnostic evaluation were inconclusive, indicating that he may have a comorbid diagnosis that met exclusion criteria. So for those reasons, we had 40 participants in the ASD group, and their mean age of those boys was just over six years. For our control group, there were 40 age-matched participants with a median age of 6.5 years. The majority of these subjects lived in the state of Texas and below 37 degrees latitude, and that's important because this was a factor we wanted to have information on and control for and address due to the role of vitamin D in calcium absorption. Vitamin D um, expo sun exposure creates vitamin D in the body, and we wanted to make sure that we controlled for that variable as much as possible. So we created, with the help of um, some assistance, we created these cute little flyers that um, one of our, that we, uh, were able to distribute in a number of different areas through other uh, research organizations. We were fortunate enough to be, we are fortunate enough to be located in Austin about less than a mile from the University of Texas and they're very helpful in helping us promote research that we're doing here. Uh, we were able to share this information on local listservs and also regional listservs so that we could recruit um, similar subjects. So the study components um, and the information that we gathered in our study design are listed here. We ask for a comprehensive three-day food diary and nutrient intake analysis. And for us in our clinical and both research practices, that in itself um, provides so much data and we are very, very, very careful in how it is um, accrued and analyzed, I guess. So we work with our families very closely. Uh, a, a registered dietitian will contact families who are working through a three-day food diary to ask if there are any ongoing questions or concerns in the process of filling it out. Once we receive that paperwork, um, we then go through it and list our questions. We set up follow-up appointments if necessary. We get photos of items the kids are eating. We give photos of items to define quantity and um, serving sizes. So we want to be as accurate as possible, short of asking families to weigh and measure their food on a scale, which in some instances we've done as well, but in this instance we did not. We just kept very careful records. Um, and to do this the, the way that we feel is the right way, it takes three to four hours investment of professional analysis, back and forth communication with families to get as accurate a read on that as possible. Uh, we included information and several conversations and written data to understand the child's elimination diet status. So we wanted to know were they on any kind of diet, prescribed or unprescribed, that might affect their nutrient intake. We wanted to look at all of their supplementation. So many, many of our kids with autism were taking various nutritional supplements, which we then um, got basic information on. So uh, families would say a multivitamin, and we would go back and say, okay, can you send me a photo of the multivitamin package we need those ingredients, that was then translated to a database so we could track exactly how many milligrams of vitamins and minerals and other nutrients that um, kids were getting each day. The in-office components of the study, once those, um, that data is, was tracked uh, prior, after we obtained consent and before the first in-office appointment so that it could be discussed at the time of the first in-office appointment. And at that appointment, we would go through all anthropometric measurements in office, same scale for each participant, height, weight, and then the same uh, research or clinical dietitian would take um, note of all measurements such as TSF and MAC. We also gathered as much gastro and 
intestinal information as we could, uh, looking at the issues that we know to be true with kids with autism, and we tried to use the instrument we had at our um, access to and that was available and that was deemed to be the best one to be used for this process at that point in time. That's evolved somewhat since then. Um, and then once the child had completed those things, there was um, a DEXA was scheduled. So that was a scan that we collaborated with a local hospital on. Um, and we had specialized pediatric radiology interpretation of the results. At the same time, a metacarpal x-ray of the hand was um, also completed. And the third component of those laboratory tests, really, um, would be the blood biomarkers that we gathered. And this was all done um, with uh, fasting blood draws first morning um, for our clients. And the markers that we wanted to look at, we looked at um, blood mineral uh, elements, we looked at basics such as the CBC and CMP, but we also added these specifically to be able to track them, given that we know vitamin D, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, and parathyroid hormone can all play a role in bone mineralization. We wanted to track those markers. We also tracked C-reactive protein and erythrocyte sedimentation rate, um, CRP and ESR, because we wanted to see if there was any ongoing inflammatory process in the body that might impact the ability to digest, absorb, um, process, uh, ac and accurately access nutrition that is provided via food and supplementation. So, <clears throat> what did we find out? Um, a number of interesting things. Uh, in terms of anthropometric measurements, our results did not differ from other studies. We learned that boys with autism and controls were similar for age, height, and weight. So there were no, certainly there were individual outliers in both groups but there were no significant differences in height, weight, BMI, or any um, measure of uh, nutritional sufficiency, such as MMAC. So all of those measure measures were similar, and there were no differences between those populations. So what did we learn about GI results and, and um, symptomatology in both populations? Well, we found that boys with autism reported significantly greater GI symptoms than boys without autism across all five domains of the GSRS instrument that we used. Additionally, um, the dietary nutrients that I'll discuss later in detail uh, that were different in these two populations are commonly reported as deficiencies in those with inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and we tried to look at that population as well as we thought through and reviewed these results, like what could be impacting it. And there were several studies out there that supported the idea that um, those with IBD also faced similar deficiencies in their <clears throat> uh, nutritional status. It reinforces, I guess, for us, all told, the idea that we need to be looking at supporting, evaluating and supporting nutritional intake and absorption ability in kids with autism, given that parents are reporting a higher level of incidence of all of these symptoms that can affect nutritional status over time. And this is not just one type of thing. I mean, this is this is not a webinar on a discussion on gastrointestinal symptomatology specifically, but we all know um, that in, in general, our population reports a higher level of GI symptoms, and that is many different things. So it can be reflux, it can be abdominal pain or bloating, constipation or diarrhea or both. Um, and there are a number of research out, uh, studies out there that support that now. Um, 
So I, I feel like the results validated um, in, in this arena, validated uh, the knowledge that we had in other areas as well. And we've tried to uh, elaborate on that, um, but um, we, we learned that more work needs to be done. So what did we learn about dietary intake? Not surprisingly, because this is very similar to other studies out there and also the nutritional um, work that we've done without looking at bone mineral density, uh, there weren't any significant changes in total caloric intake, so the kids were eating roughly the same number of calories in both groups every day. They were also eating roughly the same amount of protein, fat, and carbohydrates, and there were no significant differences in any of those macronutrients worth noting um, that were statistically important. However, as I mentioned a bit ago, there were a number of differences with micronutrients. So <clears throat> looking at um, primarily uh, minerals, we know there were significant differences in the intake of biotin, calcium, iron, phosphorus, selenium, and zinc. And that was significantly lower in those with autism versus control participants from a dietary perspective. There were also vitamins that were affected by this, and those included vitamin A, vitamin B2, B6, B12, and vitamin, vitamin D, as well as folate. So we have a short list of nutrients that solely from a dietary perspective, regardless of elimination diet status, children with autism were consuming fewer micronutrients than their typically matched peers. Though their macronutrients, the total quantity of food they were consuming and the total quantity of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates was similar. So let's talk about gluten and casein-free diet status specifically. <clears throat> Out of the 40 participants with autism spectrum disorder, 19 of them were on a gluten and casein-free diet. Of these 19 children, 15 of those were under the care of a dietitian or nutritionist who monitored nutrient intake at the time of study participation. So most of those children were seen by nutritionists and dietitians outside the Johnson Center and they were tracked um, through the, at the time of the study, which means this was really a two visit um, study participation event where they came in at time point one and we did all the in office blood work and then they went to the hospital for the workup with the DEXA and the x-ray. And <clears throat> 15 of those kids at the time that we enrolled and included them in the study were on a GFCF diet, either managed and monitored by a dietitian or nutritionist within our walls or outside our walls. The remaining four were on a GFCF diet as reported by parents, but they were not under the care of any professional at the time of the study, and so we could not substantiate compliance. We couldn't get our hands on the data to understand uh, recommendations and what the child was actually, other than what was reported on the food diary, what the child was actually consuming. The remaining 21 boys with autism did not report any dietary intervention whatsoever, and that was clearly outlined by uh, their food diaries. We could see consumption across a variety of foods. Out of the 40 control participants, two boys were following a gluten and casein-free diet. One was under the, the care of a professional and one was not. And the remaining 38 controls did not report any dietary intervention whatsoever. So <clears throat> that impacted um, our results a little bit and I'll talk about that momentarily. In terms of nutrition derived from supplements, we analyzed that separately from the nutrients derived from the diet we calculated specifically calcium and vitamin D because we felt like those were crucial to understanding um, 
bone mineral density uh, and the building of bone in a pediatric population. So we looked at supplemental calcium and supplemental vitamin D, and it was reported by um, 70, roughly 70% 70 of ASD participants that they used some form of calcium and vitamin D. We then tracked milligram support and plotted that out as well and included it um, in our analysis and it's reported in the paper. When examining um, both the food and the supplemental nutrition, calcium and vitamin D intake was significantly higher in the autism group. And that's important, I feel like, because that documents for us we know what was going in based on parental report and our analysis of what they were eating as well as any support that they were using. Um, and that, and many of those kids, as an aside, were consuming um, at RDA or just above. This was not a, a standard over-the-counter support product that, that many families were using. They were, they had been, uh, followed professionally with an appropriately prescribed vitamin and mineral support, um, I guess, regimen, and they were following it. And that could be documented from both their dietary and, nu and nutritional supplementation intake. Um, the intake of vitamin D in children with autism, this is also important, was similar regardless of whether they were on a GFCF diet or not. Um, the total intake of vitamin D from dietary and supplemental sources was significantly higher in those subjects who were on a monitored diet with a professional versus those who were not. And that just speaks to what I said, that um, we, you, we realized that they were being followed appropriately professionally um, because the targeted levels of daily intake had clearly been prescribed by a clinician with training in this area. So the biochemical markers that I mentioned that we looked at, um, there was only, uh, there were two issues that we tracked that we found significant differences in. The first was um, in vitamin D levels. And interestingly, which supports the findings moments ago, I think about supplementation and dietary intake, um, boys with autism had a higher average, a significantly higher average of vitamin D serum level than those in the control group. So uh, our boys with ASD had levels of 41.87 and uh, our boys with in the control group had a level of 31.35, which is a fairly significant difference, um, both statistically, I mean, it's, it's a pretty profound difference actually, and I think it speaks to the level of supplementation there. The other, out, the other um, significant difference um, was the level of serum magnesium, and the boys with autism had a level of 2.04 versus 1.97 in the control population. So what about bone mineral density? What did we find? Um, <clears throat> well, our work supported that of others in that boys with autism had a lower bone mineral density than their age match peers. It indicated that these boys um, had decreased uh, bone uptake, bone cortical thickness, bone, so it really validated with the most current tool available, the DEXA, the research that had been done in years past. Um, we feel like, and the research supports, that there are a number of risk factors that affect uh, BMD in children with ASD, and that means their nutritional status, which we touched on, and particularly calcium and vitamin D intake, which we were careful to track. We looked at food selectivity and their restrictive feeding behaviors, which we think is highly important, and we looked at dietary intake um, with the children that we enrolled, and notice that we didn't, our population had a fairly diverse um, feeding and food interest. So there were no clear outliers that from a clinical perspective, we would have referred for uh, a feeding clinic, for example. 
Um, but we do recognize that food selectivity and feeding behavior could impact bone mineral density. We believe GI issues could impact bone mineral density. Um, Recent studies have looked at and expanded on the work in physical activity, which would also impact bone mineral density. And of course, as I mentioned, we um, excluded in this study children with any genetic disorders that would impact um, metabolism, endocrinology, or bone mineralization, and also those on any medications that would impact bone mineralization. So we know all those things can play a role in laying down bone. Um, in children. So we feel like our findings support the theory that decreased BMD is a result of this complex process of gastrointestinal and metabolic processes that needs further investigation. So we feel also, and our results indicate, that boys in this age group don't necessarily consume less dietary calcium and vitamin D than their age match peers. And in fact, in our group, they consumed more, given the support of their supplementation, and their serum vitamin D levels were significantly higher than uh, their age match controls. The age match controls were actually just above and at risk for insufficiency in vitamin D, and the group that we looked at um, in those children with autism had <clears throat> significant um, and, and I guess appropriate levels, what we look for clinically when we uh, test for vitamin D status in the population that we serve. So what are the limitations of our study? <clears throat> Obviously, um, all of the GI symptoms that we recorded, and there are many, it's a fairly extensive and comprehensive instrument that we used. Um, they were reported by questionnaire by a parent or caregiver, but we did not confirm those clinically with any GI investigation. Um, the, the hints that we get of ongoing GI trouble, we did not collect any additional GI information from uh, gastroenterologists, for example. We did not um, collect any information from ongoing studies that would have been invasive and inappropriate, in our opinion. Um, but we tried to glean as much information as possible from parental experience and then report. And we hope that that contributes to ongoing investigation of gastrointestinal concerns here. We also, given our population, we could not stratify by autism severity. So we weren't given the number of kids that we enrolled. We could not differentiate in that way. And we could also not differentiate by ethnicity. Um, <clears throat> and I think we do need to acknowledge that uh, a portion of our kids with autism were not treatment naive and they had consulted with dietitians or nutritionists to develop um, dietary intervention and nutritional support plans. And there were families that had not sought professional help and were doing so on their own. And I do feel like that limitation needs to be acknowledged. However, I will say that um, as a clinician working in this community, we also need to acknowledge that this happens every day and is representative of our patient population. So we know that by the time families get to us or get to other clinics for care, they have either tried certain interventions on their own or they've gone to um, a new dietitian or nutritionist for feedback on first steps or they've seen a practitioner who says, hey, maybe you should take gluten out of your diet. And we know and feel like this is fairly representative of the population that can be seen um, in clinic on a weekly basis. So what are our additional takeaways for us? Um, even looking at the work that has just come out recently on physical activity or um, there are there are other and different age groups frankly there are other things that we need to be looking at. Um, we need to be looking at uh, bone mineralization and bone mineral density in younger children because um, we don't have that data available. These are fairly um, routine and not difficult procedures to gather this data for children as young as two years old. 
um, it would be interesting to know based on some of the hypotheses that are out there now um, at what point and when do you start seeing these differences um, is it a function of age is it a function of exposure what um, and how really could we document a difference in bone neural density in younger children which other none of us have have worked on yet it would also be helpful I think and beneficial to look at um, females because we don't have the data on females and for a number of reasons I think we need to be thinking about that uh, and I really hope that some future work can look at and evaluate other risk factors so there's been a follow-up study on physical activity but that's again in an older population I feel like we can be looking at this in the population that uh, we serve in the elementary school age to also gather that data and see if that's making a difference um, I regret that we didn't have a standardized measure or tool included um, when we began gathering this data um, for our study uh, because I feel like um, that's a factor and a variable that definitely plays a role that we know about and we just need to be gathering as much information on it as possible um, and then I feel like we need to be taking a hard close look at gastrointestinal concerns and their impact on bone mineral status and also overall nutrient status and what that looks like in the body um, I think that uh, we've been focused on other factors that may not actually be um, the, the crux of what's happening um, I think that uh, shifting that focus to look at biological systems perhaps so the, the GI system or the metabolic system that might be playing a role in how we use process um, and lay down bone in the body and how that might function differently in children with ASD I think that's an important um, thing to look at uh, I, I feel like there's more work to be done here clearly but for us I, I think that the takeaway really is we want to um, reassure families who are um, ha are or have pursued a dietary intervention program that if it's done well we don't have any evidence that um, calcium and vitamin D provided from supplement for example calcium and vitamin D um, provided and meeting recommended daily intake uh, meeting RDI for our kids plays as long as that's met plays a role in lowered bone mineral density um, our study suggests that boys with autism who are well managed um, actually have higher intakes and broader scope of calcium and vitamin D intake um, so I, I, I hope that that alleviates concerns for parents that it we might be triggering some problem here because I think it's more complex um, and we need to go at a bit further to say if that's not the primary concern what is the primary concern so I have some time now for uh, questions um, Denise if you have any I'm happy to answer them now yeah we've got a lot of questions <laughs> so thank you Kelly thanks for presenting that information um, a number of people had questions right off the bat about why boys were selected instead of girls so I'm sure there was a lot of thought behind that so can you elaborate sure I'm happy to um, the, there were two primary reasons number one um, we know that we see many more boys and the numbers tell us there are many more boys uh, with ASD than girls with ASD and recruiting subjects um, in the female population could be very difficult given that at the time that we began designing and enrolling for the study girls represented less than 20 percent of the children that we serve that numbers changed somewhat um, in the past few years as we've gone through this process um, but we saw fewer than our 20 percent of our population and um, the kids that we were uh, 
uh, recruiting from were uh, were broad, so but centralized here as well. And those numbers align with our our national numbers that we know. And it would be very hard to recruit the girls. The second reason that we chose boys only was because that we were trying to contribute to a body of literature that was being built on that population in itself. And we wanted to add and perhaps replicate and expand on work that was already out there. Okay. This is completely unrelated to that question, but this is somebody asking about inflammatory changes predisposing individuals to decreased BMD and what your thoughts on that might be. I think that there are, if we're speaking um, specifically to an inflammatory process that can be localized in the GI system, there's data out there through a number of research studies that shows it impacts absorption, digestion and absorption of nutrition, period. Um, there's less data out there looking at systemic inflation um, simply because we're, that's emerging. Uh, but if we're talking about localized inflammation, that's easily um, substantiated in the literature. Okay. And so another question, I'm circling back to the girls. Uh, they're talking about yes. um, when that when that study is engaged, would there be issues with menstruation and would it be looked at very differently if you're looking at the female population? Yes, absolutely. And I think that's why um, if you look at the literature in the boys alone, you there are really three separate populations that the research has been looking at and that is prepubescent, pubescent, and ad older adolescent. Um, and any work I think that researchers pursued um, with girls would have to pay particular attention to those hormonal changes um, and, and identify populations in a similar but um, informed different strategy if necessary. So looking at age ranges across other populations that this work has been done in, for example. Okay, and I had a number of people ask about the link if they wanna see the study online. Um, the study was published in the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders uh, in late 2017. And um, I can send you a link that can go out. Um, I'm sorry, I just didn't even think to put it in the slides today. No, it's okay. It's easily yeah. searchable too because it's the title of the talk, Bone Mineral Density in Boys with Autism Spectrum Disorder, My yeah. Last Name, and JAD. Okay, I'll include it. Uh, I usually send out a follow-up email after the webinar. So I will include that link in there. I, I'm sure I can okay, find great. it. So Thank the you. study link. So everybody who's on, and I will also, when we post it online, we'll include the link, study link online. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. So this person is asking about vitamin D. So their son is GFCF, but he, she's wondering, he even though they supplement vitamin D, he's still deficient. Um, so she's wondering about even with supplementation and a healthy diet, what that might suggest and how that might relate to some of the findings in this study. Understand. Um, I think there are a lot of factors that would play into analyzing uh, that. Um, when we supplement vitamin D from a dietary perspective, it, the decision on dosage needs to be made with a clinician looking at the age of the child, um, the level. So a child who has a level of 15 will be supplemented much differently than a child who has a level of 30, than a child who has a level of 50. Um, and then what does that dosage look like? So is it a short-term burst dose? Because this is a fat-soluble vitamin that um, kids can absorb. It's not something like a B vitamin that uh, passes in the urination if, um, we don't need it. So I feel like, um, one, you need to be looking at dosage and also initial level, and two, duration of supplementation, because this takes time. Even in an appropriately absor digesting, absorbing uh, situation, it can take months and months to build and baby steps, unless you're using huge loading doses, which most practitioners won't use, 
in children. Um, so I wouldn't be discouraged if this is a less than six to nine month process. I would say keep going with what you're doing. But if you're, you've been doing this for nine months or more, if you're into this healthy supported diet, I think it's worthy of talking with your treating practitioner about further workup and understanding of why that's happening because there's data that you can look for if you've not looked at stool status, for example, if you've not looked at, because there could be factors that you can um, support and symptoms that you can mitigate that would then improve your child's ability to digest and absorb and use that vitamin D appropriately.